Hello and welcome. Did you know that offshoring and outsourcing began in the early 60s and 70s as large corporations outsourced their manufacturing processes to low cost countries? General Electric was the pioneer in outsourcing at that time. My name is Ketan Gajar, founder and director at RPO Arena. With over two decades of experience developing offshore teams for the UK and the US recruiting firms, I will talk to you about making offshoring work for you. By the end of the 60-minute webinar, you will exactly know how to implement your offshore RPO initiative. What we'll be discussing today is case studies, explanation of voice and non-voice options in the offshore RPO model, benefits of offshoring, of course, beyond cost savings, where offshoring can go wrong. And believe me, there are lots of situations where it can go wrong. You really want to take notes on the slide. How can you get it right using our six step success framework? And lastly, what are the three things you need to implement your offshore up your initiative? So let's begin with the first case study. Now here, the delivery is 180 degree delivery voice resources, our client, a finance and accounting recruitment company based out of Midlands had a challenge back in June, 2021. They had lots of jobs to work on. They needed experienced resources to hit the ground running. They came to us with this challenge. We went out in the market, identified candidates with good English communication skills, recruiting experience with at least a couple of years, shared their profiles with the client. They interviewed them. And after their approval, they were deployed to work on their account. Now, what activities did, do these resources work on? They work on everything right from sourcing the candidates, pre-screening them, and also pre-qualifying them as for the client's requirement. Just last year, this team delivered a GM of circa one and a half million sterling pounds. In terms of our success story, the client started with two staff back in June, 2021, and now have scaled the team to over 15 resources based out of our offices in India. Let's talk about another case study. Now this is totally different, a non-voice based CV screening service. Our client, a leading technology recruitment company based out of London. They had a problem where they received a ton of applications to their job AdWords and LinkedIn AdWords. Their recruiters were spending a lot of time sifting through CVs, wherein they should be focusing on creating rapport with the candidates, placing more candidates and bringing in more revenue. They came to us with this challenge. We identified experienced tech resourcer who can hit the ground running. The client interviewed them. They started with one resource and now have a team of three. This is a totally non-voice based service where the resourcer is sifting through the CVs. So just in the last one year, we have sifted through over 50,000 CVs, saving hundreds of man hours for the recruiters to focus on their core task, which is developing new business, generating margins, and pleasing more candidates. Let's deep dive into the elements of what is voice and what is non-voice when it comes to offshoring. Voice. So any activity that requires a phone-based or a video-based interaction is categorized under voice-based services. What elements does it represent? CV sourcing plus candidate pre-screening calls. So even if you got you know, the, the candidates to be asked common questions like, are you looking for a new job? What's your salary? Where are you looking to work, et cetera, et cetera. Just basic pre-screening calls, a voice-based element, and which is where it's a voice-based activity. Candidate pre-qualification, similar exercise. Database regeneration. So you're set on a pile of CVs on your system you want to know which candidates are actively looking and you can actually utilize the database to a good use. So the resources here, go out, deep dive into your system, contact the candidates via phone calls, identify their current status, update it on your system so that your recruiters can actually match those candidates and book them into different jobs as per your requirements. You're also looking at pre-employment screening calls, contractor care, emails and calls. So anything to do with contractor care compliance, be it technol uh, you know, technical recruitment, be it healthcare recruitment, there's a, there's a ton of compliance to be done. 
Uh, you need the compliance officers, the contractor care team to reach out to the candidates, get their right to work documents in, get their, their health documents in, et cetera, et cetera, process on your system. But it needs a phone-based approach. It needs, it needs a voice-based element. And which is why this service is categorized into a voice-based category. And within the finance and accounting function, you still have credit control where you're supposed to reach out to, you know, obviously your clients uh, for payments. So what does non-voice element categorize? Non-voice, so anything that does not require any phone or video-based interaction comes under this category. Let's see what services does it and can pass. CV sourcing, so just as, you know, creating Boolean strings, going to LinkedIn, finding out relevant candidates, CVs, uploading on, on your documents. Market mapping, uh, if you're a boutique agency or, or an agency, you know, looking to develop a new, new market, uh, you want to research your market. You want to know who are the, 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 the target competitors or who are the target candidates. You want their LinkedIn profiles. You want their contact emails, uh, phone numbers. You want their mobile numbers, preferably. So everything is categorized into market mapping. Again, a non-voice based exercise, which is more research oriented. No candidate interaction, no client interaction over calls. It's all web-based. CV formatting, straightforward, putting the candidate CVs onto your CV templates. You've got any admin activity, you know, ranging from skill coding on your system to cleansing your internal database. Again, you know, if you just want, uh, you know, to check duplicates, delete duplicates, send out emails to the candidates, upgrade your database, et cetera, et cetera. Anything to do with back office, which is payroll, accounting, et cetera. So voice and non-voice. Voice-based activity is the element where majority of the recruiters end up gaining advantage from offshore RPO business models. Let's talk about the benefits uh, offshoring offers. And yes, uh, there are five other benefits beyond cost savings. Let's see. You get access to skilled talent. Now, offshoring means, you know, diving into a global pool, a diverse talent pool. So you get, you know, access to graduates with good English communication skills, but outsourcing, you know, gearing, you know, in the last decade or so, there's a pool of experienced resources and recruiters you can actually choose from. So that's that's number one criteria, you know, that, that's a big benefit. You know, you, you don't have, you know, you, you get lots and lots of options to choose from when it comes to accessing skilled recruiting talent. Scale quickly. Well, scalability is one of the biggest benefits of offshoring. You know, you want to build a large team, you want to build a team of 100 recruiters, it's possible when you offshore solely because of the amount of talent available offshore. Flexibility, well, flexibility in terms of contracts, flexibility in terms of the scope of work. You know, you, you offshore starting with one function and you want to change the function, you know, later in the future, the model gives you that flexibility. Again, you're not investing a large sum when it comes to your liabilities. So the contracts range from you know, quarterly to monthly rolling contracts to, to annual contracts, depending on how you want the offshore up your model to work for you. You've got growth. Well, you're not going to be spending time micromanaging your, your teams. You know, th th there's a management structure the offshore up your brings to the table. Uh, you're not investing time in hiring candidates. You're not investing time in managing them on an average day. You're not investing time in replacements. You know, you're not investing time in literally micromanagement, mi micromanaging every bits and bobs of the activity. So it gives you enough time to focus on your core, to develop your business. And that is where, along with the offshore RPO model, your top line and bottom line both grows. Of course, cost reduction, you know, is one of the major factors and it's a byproduct of outsourcing. So you're looking at up to 50% cost reduction. And lastly, the biggest benefit is higher retention rates. When you deploy resources, back office professionals, compliance officers, offshore, their growth journey is not as aggressive as the growth journey of onshore resources. They stick around for the long time in the same role. Of course, the, the clients spend time uh, looking after them. We spend time looking after them, but the retention rates offshore are much higher. What that does is it gives you business continuity. It gives you business stability. It gives you, you know, time to build another verticals. It gives you time to scale quickly and ultimately grow your business. So higher retention rates is one of the biggest USPs of working with an offshore RPO partner. 
let's talk about where offshoring goes wrong. Now, this is one major element where offshoring actually, you know, gets a bad rep as well. And there's a lot of information here, you know, th that you want to take home and work on if you're planning on offshoring. So let's talk about what are the major points of failure. Let's start with lack of clarity. Now, a lot of recruitment firm owners dive into offshoring without understanding what is it that they want their offshore RPO team to work on. What is it that they really expect from the offshore RPO team? And that is one thing, you know, which sort of it starts with a failure. You know, if you're not clear what you want your team members to work on offshore or onshore, it's not going to work. And that's where, you know, offshoring goes wrong. No training and knowledge transfer. Well, a lot of companies, when they offshore, their concept is, I'm going to send the, the jobs to somebody offshore, somebody in India or Philippines or South Africa, wherever they are. Uh, they're going to come up with a bunch of CVs. And yeah, that's that's my job. That's job done. Well, if you really want to get offshoring right, you will have to spend time training and transferring knowledge, just like you do it onshore. So no training and knowledge transfer is one of the other significant factors where the project fails. No dedicated person to drive the project. Well, if you are a small to mid-sized recruiting agency, and if you're a business owner, and if you are the one trying to drive this project, like any other project, believe me, you're not going to have enough time to dedicate your time and resources to make offshoring work. Most of the times, this is one major reason where offshoring gets wrong because you know the, the, the onshore team members, the, the MD or the director or even the manager has no time to spend you know enough duration, enough time over Teams or Zoom, whatever, with the offshore teams to drive the project. So ultimate failure. Lack of documentation and process guidelines. Well, you have to note things down, you know, irrespective of onshore or offshore. If you look at offshoring as a strategic initiative, you want to document your processes. If you just tell somebody that, okay, fine, I want you to work on X, Y, Z, exactly the way you work. Uh, it's a concept of Chinese walls, you know. Uh, you, you're, you're never going to find something, you know, work exactly in the same way as you're working on, unless it's documented, unless you've got standard operating procedures in place. No trust and patience. Well, you will need an element of trust and then patience definitely to make offshoring work for you. A lot of times, you know, companies believe that outsourcing or offshoring is going to do magic. You know, it's going to be miraculous and uh, all their problems are going to vanish uh, tomorrow or within 24 hours. Well, if only it was, it's not the situation. So having good time, trust and patience is really important. Otherwise, offshoring fails. That's exactly where it goes wrong. And lastly, this is really, really, really important is offshoring problem areas. You don't want to offshore functions or activities which are already in a mess because what it's going to happen is it's going to create 10x problems. Let's say, you know, if you want to offshore your payroll process, but it's already in a mess, your candidates are already unhappy with you. Your recruiters are unhappy with you because the candidates are not you know, getting paid on time and you want to offshore that process exactly in the same shape, it's going to create 10x or probably 100x problems and you will lose your faith from offshoring. A lot of recruiting companies make this mistake that our problem is X, Y, Z, let's offshore, let's put some bodies offshore uh, and then they'll resolve it. No, it doesn't. It, requ it requires a combination of clarity, training knowledge transfer, dedicated you know, a resource who is actually going to drive the project for proper documentation with standard operating procedures. Unless you have these things into place, all your outsourcing is, is your problems. And when you do that, that is exactly where offshoring goes wrong. Don't offshore your problems unless you want 10x problems. So how can you get offshoring right? Well, let's check our six step success framework. You have to define objectives, scope of work, systems and processes exactly in the way you define the scope of work or job specification 
when you onboard somebody on shore. For example, if you're going to onboard a resourcer on shore, you would outline all the activities and the tasks that they're supposed to work on, their KPIs as well. Who, who will they report to? Who will train them? Who will guide them? So you want to make sure that you got as much information as possible in terms of definition properly documented before you begin your offshore journey. You want to create KPIs and dependencies. Well, and don't make a mistake of creating the KPIs uh, off in, in comparison with your top performer. Create the KPIs exactly like when you take on a rookie and what expectations do you have? Also discuss the dependencies. Now, a lot of times when companies offshore and outsource, they forget about the dependencies. What do I mean by dependency? So for example, if I'm working for you, the biggest de dependency that I have is feedback, exactly like you have it on your clients. So unless you give the feedback, you know, there's not going to be any, any improvement. So in line with the KPIs, you want to define the dependencies and it can be in terms of feedback, the tools you provide, the types of jobs. Now, a lot of times companies offshore and they give stale jobs to the offshore team to work on. When you do that, the result is obviously destructive. Your objective of offshoring does not work because somebody's already worked onshore on those jobs for a day, a week, a couple of weeks, and then you just want to give something which has already been worked upon. Now, that's a major dependency for the offshore team. How can they show or how can they demonstrate their skill set and capabilities? So you want to make sure that you define every dependency in detail before you offshore. Assemble your offshore team as required. So yes, you want to make sure that you define the objectives, you define the number of people, you define the scope. So you, you have to define that, okay, fine, I need two resources, I need two payroll officers. You develop the team offshore. And most importantly, you also nominate somebody onshore, a champion to drive your offshoring initiative. If you don't have that, you know what? It's not, it's not really going to be long-term because this project, offshoring, really needs time, it needs patience, it needs trust, and you need someone on shore to handhold and drive this project. Analyze. So you want to review and analyze performance. So you got your you know, measure, measure approach in place, you, you build the team, so you got your KPIs, you, you got your dependencies. The fourth step here is to review and analyze the performance. Now, how do you do that? One is, you know, you, you got your weekly reviews in place. You, you, you want to conduct weekly reviews with your offshore team members, which the offshore team managers will, will conduct. And in, in turn, they will have weekly reviews with yourself or a part of SMT. They'll go through good, bad, ugly, KPIs versus actions delivered. Are there any blind spots, any red flags? And you want to analyze each and every performance. Now, I tell this to every client, when you are reviewing performance of your offshore team members and analyzing the performance, Review it on the basis of themes. So let's say they are working on 10 activities. You don't want to give a blanket feedback that, oh, everything's good or everything's bad and you're unhappy. You want to outline you know, all those activities that yes, you know, CV sourcing, really good CVs coming through, pre-screening really, really going well, pre-qualification really going well. Well, it's the volume of CVs that we need to increase. So yes, you, you, you're happy with the overall activity that the offshore team is delivering, but you want them to work on increasing the volume of CVs. That's one. Two is you know, probably the frequency of the way the candidates are coming through. You know, if you have feedback that yes, you know, you're missing out on putting notes on the system. So you give that feedback, you review, you know, each and every activity in detail against giving a, a blanket feedback that, you know what, uh, the person XYZ person is doing really well or not doing really well. So that does not give you any room for improvement. You want to give feedback and review performance in a way that there is a theme-based feedback. Implement continual you know, improvement processes. So once you give the feedback, you of course you know, want to make sure that you, you, you put an improvement process in place. And this can range from anything, you know, ranging from refresher training, if there are new activities that you're including in the scope of work, you want to make sure that you, you train the team if there's new geography you're adding, you know, you maybe give geography training. So whatever it is, but you want to monitor the performance on a regular basis and you want to monitor the improvement on a, on a regular basis. So the fifth step is really you know, imperative in making sure that you gain confidence 
you know, as and when the time progresses in your offshoring journey. So define, measure, build, analyze, and improve. Again, a significant factor in gaining your confidence for yourself and your teams. And lastly, you know, control. You want to build a system to maintain the improvements. Now, you know, you you, you reach 10, you, do, you don't want to go back to six. So what is that structure that you must have? And we will handhold you to the entire process of defining your objectives, your, your goals, because, you know, as a business owner, you know, you might have hundred things on your list. You want to narrow it down in terms of what are the, the real challenges that you need help with? How can you define objectives? How can you create KPIs? What are the KPIs the offshore team members actually deliver? What is the timeline the offshore teams need to deliver? How to recruit your, you know, or hire your offshore team? How to retain them? Because building a team is as much important as retaining them as well and, and sustaining your business. So we've got templates. We, we've got that, the, the entire structure to handhold you through the process. How can you review and analyze performance? So if you've got standard templates, fantastic. If not, we can help you with that as well. Implement continual improvement processes. Now, this does not happen without your feedback and your time. Your business units, your team managers, your business managers have to invest time, just like you do it onshore, in giving feedback, in telling the offshore staff that this is where you're doing really good, this is where we need improvements, and this is how we are going to do it. And the offshore team will work with you to bring improvements and also sustain them. So our six-step framework has really worked for a number of clients, defining, measuring, building your team, analyzing performance, improving performance and controlling the performance to make sure that it stays as is and it sort of works from there on. So a six step success framework from RP Arena to make offshoring really work for you. Well, I've got my free ebook here. So if you are considering offshoring and you want access to uh, the ebook, Dummy's Guide to Developing Your Offshore Team, you can have it for free. It's a totally an operational document without any sales pitch in it. There are some FAQs as well, which are, will really help you drive through your offshore initiative. So if you want the free ebook, just just uh, ping me into a chat or email me at ketan at RPO Arena, and I'll be more than happy to share it with you. So what do we do? We build offshore teams that really work. We provide every activity within the recruiting lifecycle that does not require a warm handshake. So right from all the voice-based elements to non-voice-based elements, everything customized as per your requirement. And this is all based upon our six, six point success framework. The framework that will help you achieve your offshore up your initiative, a great success. And if you want more information about RPO, feel free to ping in the chat or email me at ketan at rpoarena.com and I'll be more than happy to catch up with you. Let's talk about what are the three things to do before you, before you get started. Well, it's very simple. There's no, no complication whatsoever. You want to start with defining clear objectives. What is your reason for offshoring? If your objective is just reducing cost, you really want to think through, you want to sit with your team, you want to really identify what are those functions they really need help with. And that's exactly how you start get started in your journey. Maybe have a chat with an offshore up your provider. You know, if, if they're able to talk to you, if you, know, if you want to talk about how to scope out things, how to identify the areas you want to offshore, or how to identify the areas you, you really need help. Uh, for example, you know, if your team are spending more time just processing timesheets or sifting through CVs, or you got lots of jobs and you need help you know, with, with volume of candidates coming through your inbox, you want more submissions, but you have to define the objectives to make your offshore RPO initiative a success. Documenting the processes you want to off offshore. Well, again, we, we've covered this. This is a major flaw, you know, where offshoring goes wrong. If you haven't documented what you want the offshore team to work on, you're really going to struggle because you won't really remember you know, what you told somebody yesterday because as a director, as a business owner, or even as a manager, 
you got lots of things on your platter. You know, you discuss the process in a certain way for somebody. And if not documented, they will not follow it. You want to make sure you, you document a step-by-step -step process for everything, because you know you, you might follow a different way of approaching candidates or processing timesheets or doing compliance, whichever it is, document every bit of information. Identify a champion to drive the relationship. Very, very important. You want somebody accountable. You want a champion. You want to incentivize this person to make this initiative a success. A lot of businesses, in my experience in the past, when they offshored, and then when they offshored with the with the with the idea that you know it's a strategic business initiative for them, they want to grow their offshore team, they incentivized the champion on shore. They discussed with them their roadmap, their journey. And if they made offshoring work, this is exactly how the business would grow and then their profiles would grow and how they would get help. So from recruiter's perspective, saving time, filling more, more shifts, more jobs, delivering a, a bigger GM, a bigger commission check. So identify somebody who can actually drive this project solely instead of you trying to manage one of you know, 50 things. So defining clear objectives, documenting the processes you want to offshore, and the champion who is going to drive this project. And lastly, treat your offshore team members exactly like you treat your onshore team members. Believe me, if you treat the offshore team as third party or fourth party and treat them with, you know, I mean, just 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 as as somebody you know working for you as a temp somewhere, it's not going to work. You want to build that equity. And all the initiatives that I've seen, you know, really being successful in my, you know, almost 20 years of my career, they have been where clients have shown interest in making it work for them and with the offshore team. So if you show interest in, in, in your offshore team members, they will be interested in you and in your business. If you lose interest, and when I say treat your offshore team members like you treat your onshore team, I mean, you know, communicating with them effectively, regularly, giving them feedback when required, recognizing their achievements, rewarding them for their achievements. A lot of our clients also have initiatives like, you know, early Friday offs, uh, you know, sending them for pizza parties. Uh, they are part of their lunch clubs. They're part of their, you know, annual trips, uh, exchange programs. There's a separate webinar coming on retaining your offshore teams. I will uh, share the link later, but yes, you can do lots of things in terms of treating your offshore team members exactly like your onshore teams. So if you like the webinar and want to learn more about developing your offshore team, you can reach out to you. I really hope you enjoyed the webinar. Cheers.